to concentrate on the Atlantic and the European theatres for this topic. And uh, World War II in those countries uh, mentioned from 1st of September 39 to the 8th of May 1945. In that time, the Battle of the Atlantic was ongoing, and it's probably the longest battle in throughout World War II. And um, it will inevitably be uh, British Royal Navy orientated because of uh, the locations Atlantic. Uh, images will be shown both of ships and of models to illustrate this as we go along. This is a 1940 map of the world. I've shrunk it down a bit, concentrating on the European Atlantic. As you can see, uh, the UK in pink there is an island and dependent on supplies across the seas uh, to keep it going. So we have the Atlantic, a lot of routes across the Atlantic. And we also have to have convoys and trading through the Cape of Good Hope up to Freetown in West Africa, through Gibraltar and up into the UK. Later on in the war, 1940, Italy joined in in June 40, and that took on the Mediterranean theatre as well. And in the summer of 41, uh, the Soviets were involved in Russia, and we had to then send convoys from the UK, often via Iceland, over the top of Norway through to Manx and Arkhangelsk in uh, Soviet Russia. So there's a huge amount of sea and a huge amount of shipping all needing escorting. The North Sea, I'll mention the North Sea, that is to between uh, UK and Denmark. So that is an area which was particularly a concern in the First World War. I'll mention that a little later. By the way, Germany, when they occupied Norway and France, uh, Belgium, Denmark, etc., most of that Western Europe seaboard were all in German hands, and it made it very easy for them to set up U boat bases in the, along that long coastline. And that really added to headaches to the Navy, the British Navy, to try and sort out anti U boat tactics. In the, initially in the war, Germany sent out armed merchant cruisers and battleships into the Atlantic uh, to raid con uh, merchant ships in, in carrying supplies to the UK from anywhere in the world. That was a limited success. And after the sinking of the Bismarck in May 1941, that really ceased and U-boats took over as they were more effective, more economical and the rest of the war ended up as an anti-U-boat war, really. The convoy system, which had been thought about in the First World War, was initiated by the Admiralty, the British Admiralty, shortly after the start of World War II. They weren't right on the ball immediately, but they did get going fairly quickly. The escorts of the convoys were in short supply for the first year or two. And of course, there are no major fleet engagements in the Atlantic of World War II, such as Jutland in World War I. So the destroyers had to sort of alter their role, really, to combat that rather than in fleet actions with torpedo. Following the end of World War I, in the between wars years, uh, the UK used late wart build destroyers and until 1927, when a set of new destroyers uh, was funded to flotillas I think eight ships each year from 1927, starting with those beginning letter A, B, right through to classes of I. This is HMS Glowworm, a typical uh, interwars destroyer, 1,350 tons, mostly torpedo armament, four 4.7 inch guns, and very little anti aircraft or anti submarine capabilities. You see, on the stern there, the uh, the mine sweeping apparatus there that was very heavily involved. So that was the thinking, more like World War One efforts with very little air activity then. Uh, a J-class destroyer, 1939, and this very much set the pattern for destroyers built throughout the war years in the UK. Single funnel. Um, this one has got. Uh, three twin 4.7 inch guns, which weren't high angle particularly, they mostly surface. And um, later on, there's four, four guns for most of the world built destroyers. Uh, again, heavy torpedo armament with 10 um, tubes 
uh, some increased anti-aircraft uh, capability behind the funnel there. There's a four barrel pom-pom, but only machine guns or bridge wings. And again, uh, more anti-submarine, uh, anti-minesweeping um, mine, rather capabilities on the stern. So very little really of the anti-U-boat uh, stuff. By the way, F is the correct prefix letter for this. Uh, and it's changed the G as soon as the war started. But only when ships came in for repair uh, or maintenance, it was changed to G as and when they came into dock. So F's remained for quite a while. It's not F for now frigates, of course, in the Royal Navy, but not then. In 1938, the British Admiralty, uh, thinking that a war was about to come, they finally got round to it, and convoys were needed and escort vessels. These were specifically designed, this is the Hunt class of 13 to 1400 tons for that role. These are smaller, lighter, and perhaps quicker to build than the normal escort, fleet escort destroyers. They had a good high angle, low angle armament of twin four, four inch guns forward and aft. And uh, you can see here in exposition, there's a, a pom pom, four barrel pom pom as well. These were made in big numbers and the uh, did sterling work during the war. Brissenden was of the same class, Hunt class, but this was uh, by manufacturers called Thornycroft, shipbuilders Thornycroft, who had two designs of their own, this one Brissenden, slightly larger than the Hunt I showed you just now, and six twin, uh, six uh, four-inch uh, high-angle, low-angle guns, three torpedo tubes only, and more anti-submarine activity on the on the stern there with uh, depth charges. These are different these ships because they've got a focus on running three quarters the length of the ship which protected the crew which is otherwise it open decks in the early typical destroyer designs. This is a VW destroyer for 1918 as it was then and uh, four single four inch guns, plenty of torpedo tubes Virtually no ACAC um, stuff at all. Some of them had to be converted into things called long range escorts so they could escort convoys across the Atlantic and Gibraltar, etc., as I described earlier. And this one had its four funnel removed and the boiler remo room removed and uh, oil tank put in its place under the, where the four funnel would have been. This has extended its uh, range so it could cross the Atlantic without having to necessarily refuel in Newfoundland or Iceland or somewhere en route. Of course, a lot of the transatlantic convoys were literally from Canada and USA to the UK. Uh, these originally designed these V&W classes for North Sea work, which was, would have been a short range, but obviously in this World War II, the range had to be extended. Uh, HMS Salisbury, which I made a miniature of and I showed you in the May meeting. This was an ex-US destroyer from the First World War and converted for RN use with a new bridge on open bridge on top and a 271 radar and plenty of depth charges on the stern there. These were part of the 50 destroyers agreed between Churchill and Roosevelt at the beginning of the war to help us with the shortage of escort destroyers at that particular point early in the war. Other classes of ships for escort work were, of course, corvettes, sloops, and frigates. Again, the smaller than destroyers, but uh, very capable anti-submarine uh, vessels. World War I, the submarine detection was very primitive. It was non-existent. Hydrophones were used by surface ships, but had to be virtually stopped before they could hear anything. Uh, which might be uh, of a moving uh, submarine, or occasionally a sighting of a periscope, or the thing that gave it away a lot. If you saw a torpedo coming to you from the point of origin, you know where the U-boat might have been at that particular moment, because the torpedo tracks were visible, and before later ones which had no track, they were developed later on in the war. The unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917 nearly brought uh, the UK to its knees because of loss of seaborne supplies. However, in 1917 and later into the 1920s, ASDIC Anti-Submarine De Detection Investigation Committee, or some people disagree with that, but that's what it's generally known as, and in the USA, Sound and Navigation and Ranging in the USA, Sonar. 
the two countries collaborated in examining ways of detecting subsurface uh, vessels. In quartz crystals with piezoelectric properties enable sound to be projected from under the hull of the uh, surface ship within the sea up to about 2000 yards ahead and a return echo indicated a submerged object. The British ultimately thought well, this is great and we don't need to worry any more about it. We've sorted out the threat, but it wasn't foolproof. Early in World War II, there were lots of techniques where the U-boats, German U-boats could avoid detection and escape if being attacked. So it wasn't a foolproof answer, as I say. This is an ASDIC dome, which would be very similar to the sonar type developed in the US. Uh, this is a pod which was lowered from uh, the center of the hull underneath about the bridge and the transducer or oscillator sent out the sound wave, which took a little time to travel through water, but if it hit a solid object, it would bounce back with an echo. And that's how you found uh, probably a ship. Radar waves and radio waves did not travel through water, so we had to use sound waves. Okay. When retracted on this model, you can just see the dome there being retracted into the bottom of the hull there. And that's when the ship was moving at speed and you didn't need the wash of the water around the Hesdic dome. Otherwise that would destroy the ability to listen to the echo. So only at a certain speed could you use Hesdic. And when you were not moving at a slow speed, you could retract the dome as you see. Moving on now to the anti-submarine detection. This diagram actually shows you the beam. There's the surface ship on the top and the angle down uh, under the surface of the beam, the sound beam, to try and pick up the uh, possible U-boat if it's one there. On the lower one indicates the range of action of the uh, sound waves. The deeper red one shows you a 15 degree thing sweep and then you kept moving it on, moving it on until you've covered about 90 degrees worth ahead of you in the ship, chasing up the U-boat. So it had to be turned manually by the operator, at least early on in the war, and uh, until they found a contact. The only thing is, in the early days, that the, the depth was not very detectable. You could see, find a, an echo ahead of you on the surface uh, escort ship, but the uh, depth was not very easily determined. The British Admiralty thought the submarines couldn't go much below 300 feet. But um, it was discovered that German U-boats could go down to 600 feet without cracking up. So that was out of the range of the ASDIC in these early days. Other objects for the ASDIC and the sonar to reflect against obviously were whales, large well, live objects, uh, schools of fish, or turbulence created by the props from the U-boat could uh, give a false echo or even a wreck on the sea bottom if it was a fairly shallow water. So these could be confused and the ASDIC uh, operator in the ship, you had to be pretty experienced to be able to determine which one it might well be. So no point in chasing off the whale when you really want to get at a U-boat. This is diagrammatic looking down from a girl's eye view of the convoy organization. Uh, the ships are in rows, lots of rows, and spreading about perhaps a mile or more, two miles wide. Uh, the lead ship, as shown in the first row there, slightly ahead, carried the convoy commodore, who was usually a retired naval officer and leading, and, uh, leading the convoy there. The, two, the four red ones are the escort ships, which showed you only four to cover a massive convoy of many ships over quite a long period of water, uh, sprayed of water. And in the early days, there were so few escorts, so a lot of ships were actually lost. Merchant ships were lost. So later on, many more became available. And even in the war, later on in World War II, they had groups of anti-U-boat uh, escort ships coming in on their own and just specifically for that purpose. Now, in the early years of World War II, the U-boats would surface at night and go up between the columns of ships, torpedo them off, just literally knocking them off. And there's not much the escorts could do about it because they couldn't see them. These things were at night, they were low in the water and very difficult to spot uh, with the naked eye. 
they're also quite maneuverable and have a low profile, as I said. So later on, the cavity magnetron, this is the thing there, the octagonal thing there with its windows on the top of the back of the bridge. That's a two, type 271 radar, which could detect surface U-boats. Uh, it's a cavity magnetron bring out a beam in a circular beam all around the ship, and it would identify a surface U-boat, which, as I say, is quite a more small target, being so low in the water. The anti-U-boat uh, weaponry, uh, certainly for most of the war, was the depth charge. Here you see some stowed on deck and one in a depth charge thrower, one mounted on a thrower. I believe they're called K-guns in the US parlance. The depth charges were thrown over the side of the ship laterally or dropped off the stern as the ship was moving along. Had to move at a certain speed to avoid the explosions of the depth charges because these exploded at a given depth, not in contact, but at a given depth with a hydrostatic pistol uh, set to a predetermined depth. Uh, the early depth charges were at 400 pounds, sink rate at eight feet per second, and uh, later 600 pound versions came along later on in the war. Sometimes it took 60 seconds for a depth charge to reach 600 feet, which is probably about the maximum depth the U-boat could uh, successfully go down to. On the model here, you can see the depth charge uh, shoots over the stern of the ship, these are quite short ones. You can see four depth charges in there. The larger things on top were smoke uh, generators for um, uh, use at sea to cover a ship when they didn't have radar and they couldn't really see through the smoke screen. On the top left there, you see in white with a depth charge, loaded on a depth charge thrower. This is to show you later on, this is a frigate actually, but uh, it is got lots and lots of racks of depth charges so they could be reloaded and this ship could then send off depth charges as much as it's like until it ran out. But this is what they could get up to and they were heavily armed for anti-U-boat activity. The four throwers to each side there in front of the depth charge um, chutes and then two behind the gun there because you further up, further forward on each side. So that would throw two each side Depth charges, you can see the pattern there. The ship would be going forward at a speed, dropping depth charges off the stern, two by four by six, and two each side to cover where the U-boat may be. And hopefully it would um, contact them, uh, it would explode and do some damage. But the ship, the escort ship had to go at speed, of course, to, uh, to avoid its... Uh, being damaged by its own explosions, particularly they were set, set fairly shallow. U-boats weren't uh, stupid by a long way. They could uh, avoid detection by moving under a thermocline layer. That's a different temperature in the water layers, which could uh, deflect, uh, deflect the uh, sound waves from the sonar. They could disturb water uh, from their propellers, turn it up, and that would act as a false echo, go deep 600 feet, which is more difficult to attack because I said the depth of the sound wave uh, sonar didn't go that far, or pin and were for the German turn for artificial gas bubbles. These were solid tablets which they could um, shoot out from a chute somewhere as a submarine that submerged, and they would burst into gas bubbles, and there's enough of those to resemble the size of a U-boat, which might fool the Aztec or sonar operator. So there's various techniques where they could escape. Towards the end here, 1941, uh, the Royal Navy introduced this thing called a hedgehog, which is 24 spigot-mounted mortars, set at a slight angle each in rows of four. And these were mounted on the forecastle and would send a Mortar bomb or series of mortar bombs ahead of the ship, not dropping off the stern or sideways, but ahead of the ship. These were what are they now? 65 pound weight charges, and they only contact operated. So if you didn't get an explosion, they'd miss the U boat. If you get an explosion, it hit it, and uh, it should be enough to um, crack the hull open. These were stabilized to counteract the roll and pitch of the ship. 
but they need a lot of maintenance to work and it's quite a hard job to keep reloading these mortars each time you uh, send them off. I think they went off in the first row first and the next and the next very quickly, spread a big pattern. At least the ship didn't have to, Gascot ship didn't have to race ahead, obviously, unlike in the depth charge attack. This was developed later in World War II, a three barrel thing with a 390 pound charge. So each, set, each of the three barrels set at a slight angle to spread out rather than in line ahead. And these again projected forward over, over the front of the ship, uh, the escort ship to um, explode. I'm pretty sure they're contact ones, I'm not sure, but I think they're contact ones as well. Later on in the war, they were put on the stern of ships sometimes too. And there's a destroyer at Shatton in uh, UK, a preserved destroyer from that era, with two of these on the stern. Uh, so you can identify the squid. It was trainable, did its job by a head throwing weapon technique. Later on, after World War II, other developments were the Limbo, which is something very much like this, but a bigger and more powerful three barreled anti submarine weapon. Uh, anti submarine torpedoes, which could find a, a submerged object but control their own depth and pattern so they could go deep and explode against the submarine hull. They weren't just set at a predetermined depth like the conventional torpedoes. You had dunking sonar from helicopters once more, uh, listening, dropping a sonar thing into the water from the helicopter to listen for sound, and magnetic anomaly detection, MAD, which from, from aircraft flying overhead to detect um, magnetic changes under the water, or in the water rather, uh, from a submarine or a steel hull. So I hope that's a very quick pricey for you. To, it gives some idea for those who may not be as familiar as some of us on anti-submarine warfare in that particular period. Thank you.